the burdens that are in this building today. God, it's hard to know. The marriages that are struggling, the relationships that are being torn, the economic pressures that some are feeling, God, the distresses and the discouragement of living in a sinful, fallen world. And Father, it might just be that somebody today has come here and this might be their last stop for hope. And Father, it is my prayer that today, in just a moment, when we open our Bibles, Lord, that if we are a person who feels trapped or we are a person that feels condemned, Father, that today we might find freedom as we open our Bibles and discover the freedom that's in Jesus. Heavenly Father, I don't know of a greater problem than men and women, teenagers, feeling trapped. No way out. No good solution. God, I've met people upon people upon people that just feel so condemned by their actions. And what they desperately need is forgiveness. So, Father, today, as we prepare to open our Bibles, it is my prayer, Father, that we won't be in a hurry, that we'll understand what's before us. And today, we might find hope in the person of Jesus. All of our songs this morning have been about love, your love. And I pray, God, today that your love will manifest itself in this place in a very supernatural way. So, Lord, as we open our Bibles now, it is my prayer that you'll open our hearts and that you'll open our minds. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we get ready to open the Bible this morning and look at our text, we, we believe that the Bible is God's Word to us. So let's quote together Psalms 119, 105. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Let's say it again. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Today, as you open your Bibles... I want you to think that God's Word is a lamp to your feet and a light for your path. And it might just be that today, as you and I begin uh, looking at Mark chapter 8 in our series, Walking in Wisdom, and as we look at what it means to be trapped, that this message has a special, special application to you. Because I'm wondering if maybe you have ever felt trapped, cornered, no matter which way you look, there is no good way out of the situation that you are now in. Have you ever felt trapped? Today, Jesus is going to be trapped. Did you know that there's a promise in the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13? There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God will never allow you to be tempted above that you are able, but will always provide a way out. Did you know that with God, as a believer in Jesus Christ, as a Christian, did you know that God always, always, always has a way out? Even though you feel trapped, even though you feel there's no good solution, God has a solution. And maybe you don't feel trapped today. Maybe you feel condemned. You've done something, and all eyes are looking at you. 
And it doesn't matter where you go. It just seems like everybody's staring at you and condemning you, condemning you, condemning you. Today, we're going to meet a person who feels condemned. And out of all the people that are condemning one person, the Lord Jesus cares about that person and provides forgiveness. So if you've ever felt trapped, ever felt condemned, then this story today could very well be your story. And as we get ready to go into our story in John chapter 8, I need to remind you of the context in which we find ourselves. The context in which we find ourselves is six months before Calvary. Six months from now, Jesus is going to die on the cross. And we know that from Mark chapter 7, verse 2, because it dates itself at the Feast of Tabernacles, which happens in the fall of the year, and Jesus will be crucified in the spring of the year at Passover. But as you think about the, ca- the cross six months out, I want you to look and realize that his brothers, his family, still doesn't believe in Jesus. Chapter 7, verse 5, even his own brothers did not believe in him. His brothers didn't believe in him and the nation. There was a lot of animosity building between Jesus and the people. Chapter 7, verse 1, the Bible says, After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea, because the Jews there were wanting to take his life. So they're wanting to take his life. In chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus said, The world cannot hate you, because, but it hates me. So they're trying to kill him. They hate him. And in verse 32, the Bible says that the Pharisees and the crowd had sent officers out to arrest him. So as you think, just six months away from Calvary, there's a lot of animosity building. The brothers of Jesus don't believe in him. The populace as a whole are developing either we're going to follow him or we hate him. Many hate him. Many want him dead. The leaders want him arrested. And then as a result of all of that animosity, there was fear. Chapter 7, verse 13 says, But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews. And you understand fear, don't you? Because just last week we learned that the fire chief of the city of Atlanta was fired because he said he believes that marriage should be between a man and a woman. And because of his belief in biblical Christianity, he lost his job. You understand fear because you watch the news and you hear about the Internal Revenue Service targeting uh, conservatives and conservative Christians. And so you understand fear. And the Bible says that people were fearful to talk loudly about Jesus, so they whispered about Jesus. And not only were they fearful, but they had become very insulting. If you looked in chapter 7, verse 15, they said, How did this man get such learning without ever having studied? They looked down their nose at Jesus. They said, You know, he hasn't gone to any of our schools. He hasn't been trained by any of the great rabbis. And they looked down their nose at Jesus. And, and you look sometimes, and it seems like the elite in our nation look down on those of us who believe in biblical Christianity. And not only were they insulting his education, but the Bible says in verse 20, they said, you're demon possessed. They insulted him personally. And then in verse uh, 47, they said, you mean he's deceived you also. So they insult Jesus. You don't have a great education. You're demon possessed. You're just a deceiver. And the result was that the nation and the people were divided. John chapter 7, verse 43 Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. And last week I shared with you about some of those divisions. I talked to you about Ruth Sweets, if you recall, the widow who lived in Spring Lake Park, Minnesota. And she lived in a public housing uh, complex that was federally funded by the Housing and Urban Urban Development. And Ruth Sweets was having a conversation in an open area about the Bible and about Jesus. And she was told, you can't talk about God, you can't talk about Jesus in the public area because this apartment complex receives money from the housing and urban development. I talked to you about the division because of the fire chief in Atlanta. And then I shared with you how Amazon Smile said that uh, the American Family Association and the Family Research Council were considered hate groups And so Amazon Smile would not 
uh, contribute to those organizations because the American Family Association and the Family Research Council are hate groups, but the Council on Islamic American Relationships is not a hate group. And then I shared with you about the Wounded Warrior Program, about Liberty Baptist Church and Academy in Fort Pierce, Florida, who wanted to organize and send money to the Wounded Warrior Program, and they said, no, we can't accept donations from a religious organization. And so you understand about division. There's division in America about Jesus, and there was division in Jesus' time. And now that you understand the context in which we find ourselves, let's look at the content of today's passage. Because what's going to happen today is a decision has to be made. And here's the decision, quite frankly. Will the leadership of the nation of Israel say, you know, we're going to look at Jesus and we're going to follow Jesus and God as Messiah and follow them? And they're going to say no. But that's the same decision that we make as a nation, right? Are our leaders going to follow God? That's the decision. But there's also a decision not about only about leadership, but about you and I as followers. Will the people of Israel follow their leaders as they walk away from God? What will you do? What will I do? If the leadership of our nation walks away from God, what will you as an individual do? Will you walk away from God? Will you follow the leaders or will you follow Jesus? That is the question that the people are now having to decide. Because in six months, most of them are going to say, crucify him. Having said that, here's our message today. John chapter 8, starting in verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. Now the first thing I want you to see is that Jesus is a teacher. We talked about this Wednesday night. But so often you think of preachers. But Jesus was a teacher. This is the fourth time in the Gospel of John that Jesus is called a teacher. And the purpose of Jesus' teaching is so that the people will understand that God's Word is a lamp under their feet, a light under their path, and they will know how to walk in wisdom in this world that wants to pull us apart and pull us away from God. So Jesus is teaching, teaching, teaching. And that's what we want to do here this morning. Then I want you to see the trap. Here's the, the crux of today's message, the trap. Look at verses 3 to 6. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Now, the Bible says that there is this trap. Now, the trap is a very, very simple trap, but it is a trap that puts Jesus in an absolutely no-win situation. And this might be where you're at. And you need to walk in wisdom because you're in a trap and there's no good way out. Now, the trap, according to the Bible, in John chapter 8, verse 6, is a word that the King James Version says is tempting. So it's trap or it's tempting. And the whole point of this verb, trap, tempting, means to put to the test, to prove someone. Jesus was being put in a corner. It was an intentional thing that they were doing. And they said that they wanted to accuse him. Now, you should circle that word accuse because it's an interesting word. And it comes from a word that has the prefix kata, K-A-T-A, which means down, down, plus the word agora. Now, the agora is the public place where you had public discourse. If you put the word together, to accuse means to put down somebody publicly. So this was a very, very intentional trap. To put Jesus down publicly. They wanted to take Jesus down a notch or two. And so what they did was they presented him a scenario. They brought him a woman taken in adultery. Now, according to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, if somebody was brought in adultery, here's what the Bible says. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, 
both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. Very clear. They've committed adultery. They must be put to death. Or Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 23 and 24. If a man happens to meet in a town, a virgin pledged to be married, and he sleeps with her, you shall take both of them to the gate of the town and stone them to death. The girl, because she was in a town and did not scream for help, and the man, because he violated another man's wife. So there's the trap. Jesus, what are we going to do? Should we, Jesus, obey the law of Moses? Should we stone this woman to death? Well, it sounds like it. Yes, let's stone her to death. But if Jesus obeyed the law of Moses, he violated the Roman law. Because the Roman law said you cannot give capital punishment unless it goes through the Roman courts. So, Jesus, what are you going to do? Are you going to obey the law of Moses? Because if you do, you're going to violate the Roman law. Jesus, you're going to say, no, 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 we're not going to stone her to death. We've got to obey the Roman law. Because if you obey the Roman law, then you disobey the Mosaic law. Do you see that Jesus was in a no-win situation? He was trapped. He was cornered. And the whole purpose was to take him down a notch or two publicly so that the people would see this isn't the Messiah. Don't follow him. Because Jesus had no recourse. He would either ignore God's law or he'd ignore the Roman law. So we've talked about the teacher who's going to teach us to walk in wisdom. We've seen the trap, a no-win situation. I want you to take a look now at the trappers. This is very important. The trappers, according to the Bible, John chapter 8, the Bible says in verse 3, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. Now, this is important because the teachers of the law were the scribes. These were the intellectual giants of the day. These were the men who spent their entire life studying, studying, studying. We might say that they would be the seminary professors, the PhDs. They knew the law inside out. And then you had the Pharisees. The Pharisees would be like a, like me, a, a conservative pastor. And so you had this elite group of Bible educators. You had the seminary professors and you had the pastors. This is who the people were. Jesus is a teacher, the teacher, but then the teachers of the law come and the Pharisees, the professors and the preachers. Now, when you look at this, the trap is something very fascinating. And it's a trap that wants to manipulate a woman. How is it that this is going to manipulate the person? Well, look at what the Bible says. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. So here's a woman who is caught in the act of adultery. Now think about that. She's caught in the act of adultery. If you took your Bibles, and you don't need to do this, and I didn't give it, put it on the monitor, but in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, here's what the Bible says. One witness is not enough to convict a man accused of any crime or offense he may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three. So think about this. According to the Bible, the teachers of the law, the PhDs, the professors and the conservative pastors have got together. And they said, if we're going to trap this guy, we're going to bring him a woman caught in the act of adultery. So it has to be two or three witnesses. They have to catch them in the act. This had to be a setup. It absolutely had to be a setup. And these men, the teachers of the law, the seminary professors, and the pastors, had to either be looking through a keyhole to catch them in the act of adultery, standing behind a wall, peeping around, looking in a window, peeping behind a curtain, they had to catch them in the act. And these are the seminary professors and the conservative pastors. In addition to this, we know they were manipulating the situation or the girl because in all probability this girl was about 13 or 14 years old. The Bible doesn't say she was married, 
But she was probably, what Deuteronomy 22 said, she was probably pledged to be married. That means that in that culture, you pledged a girl to be married around 13 or 14. So think of it. These men, the professors and the pastors, they found a young, young girl and they manipulated her and put her in a compromising situation, peeped through a keyhole so that they could catch her in the act. So they manipulated the girl. They not only manipulated the girl, but they manipulated the situation. I want you to think about this for a moment. The Bible says they made her stand before the group. Nowhere in the Bible does it say they would pu they should publicly bring her in. The Bible would say she has to go before the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrin were in the other part of the temple, like in the kitchen over there. They didn't do that. They didn't take her to the Sanhedrin that would make a decision. They brought her before a group of people and they publicly, publicly, publicly demeaned this girl. They manipulated the situation intentionally so that they could bring Jesus down a notch or two and... Not only did they manipulate this girl, but they manipulated the situation because they were not interested in justice. Justice didn't enter into the picture. It wasn't what is the right thing to do, it's what will work. How do we know they weren't interested in justice? Because the Bible says you are to bring both the woman and the man. They didn't do that, did they? So we know they were not interested in justice. They were not interested in doing the right thing. They were only interested in what works. What's going to bring Jesus down a notch or two? How can we publicly accuse him? So they intentionally manipulated the girl, manipulated the situation, and they manipulated God's word. Both Leviticus 20 and Deuteronomy 22 said... Bring the man and bring the woman. And they didn't do that. And the Bible says the woman was caught in the act. Well, if she was caught in the act, he was caught in the act. But they didn't bring the man. So we've talked about the teacher. We've talked about the trap. We've talked about the trappers. Now, what does the person who's trapped do? What does Jesus do? What do you do when you're cornered and there is absolutely no way out? Let's see what Jesus does. Starting in the last part of verse 6, But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So how does Jesus, the trapped, how does he respond? Well, the Bible says he writes with his finger. So that's what he does. He begins to write. It's the only time in the Bible where Jesus is writing and we have no idea what he wrote. And then Jesus responds. As he's writing, they said, uh, excuse me, uh, what are you going to do about this woman? And she says, while, or while they kept on questioning, he straightened up and said, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone. If you were to circle that uh, without sin... That is the only place it's found in the Bible in the New Testament, right there, without sin. Only place in the Bible, New Testament, that's found. What does it mean? Well, I want you to think about it for a moment. Who's standing before Jesus? The teachers of the law and the pastors. I heard all my life that Jesus probably was writing down the sins of the men. I don't think that's what he was writing at all. You know what I think Jesus wrote? I think Jesus wrote out Leviticus 20.10. Bring the man and bring the woman. I think that Jesus wrote out Deuteronomy 22, 23, and 24. Bring the man and bring the woman. I think he probably circled man, underlined it, drew arrows to it. And all of a sudden, 
These professors with their PhDs, these learned teachers of the law, and these conservative pastors they saw, man, 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 and they realized that they themselves had violated God's Word. And as they violated God's Word, and as the Spirit of God told them, you violated the Bible, one by one, one by one, one by one, they walked away. Let me tell you something. I think Jesus understood this situation totally. I don't think Jesus was deceived for one moment that these teachers of the law and the Pharisees bringing all their Bible you know, this woman was taken in adultery and Moses said, I don't think Jesus was deceived for one moment by them. And Jesus never, ever, ever, if you'll notice, Jesus never denied that the woman sinned. Jesus totally understood the situation. He wasn't deceived by the religious talk, nor did he deny the woman's sin. I believe that Jesus was absolutely filled with compassion for this woman. Jesus did not dismiss her sins. Never did Jesus say, hey, it's okay to commit adultery. He never dismissed her sins. But you know what? In six months, Jesus would die for her sins. See, Jesus shows compassion. While the crowd isn't compassionate, the pastor wasn't compassionate, the professor wasn't compassionate, only Jesus shows compassion, and He'll prove that in six months when He dies for her sins. What Jesus did do, He shows forgiveness. Look at verse 11. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. You know, isn't that exactly what the Bible tells us in John three sixteen and 17? You could quote it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Jesus didn't come to condemn. He came to save. And that's what He's doing with this woman. Wait a minute. But what about the law? She violated the law. Oh my gosh, she did, didn't she? Well, how are we going to handle that? Well, if you took your Bibles and you went to Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 7, here's what you'd read. The hands of the witnesses must be the first in putting him to death. Did you know that? Did you know that the Bible says that if you're going to put somebody to death, it is the witnesses that have to throw the first stone? Were there any of the accusers left? No, they were all gone. So Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. He fulfilled it. He fulfilled it to the letter. The fact was, there was no witness left. Nobody left to pick up a stone and throw it. And the Bible says, the hands of the witnesses must be first in putting him to death. So what does Jesus do? Is there nobody here to condemn you? No one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus never, ever condoned this woman's sin. What He did is He challenged her, go do better in your life. Now, what's the connection between you and this story and me and this story? I think there are seven takeaways. And the first takeaway is this. I believe it's always easier con to condemn than to forgive. Do you? It is so much easier to condemn than to forgive. And yet Jesus is about forgiveness. And Jesus is about restoration. Jesus didn't condemn this woman. He didn't condone her sin. He did die and conquer sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says as many as received Him... To them, He gives the authority to become a child of God. The Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I'll come in. Jesus died so that you and I would not have to suffer the penalty of sin by spending eternity in hell. And He died to conquer the power of sin in your life today. Does He condemn her? No. Does He condone her sin? No. 
What he does do is he conquers sin for her, for me, and for you. The third takeaway is this. With God, all things are possible. This was an impossible situation. Do you obey the law of Moses and disobey Rome? Do you obey Rome and disobey Moses? Jesus was trapped. And there was no way out. Except the walk of wisdom tells us that there's always a way out with God. God always has a way out. And I don't know what your situation is, but I can tell you this. If you feel like you're trapped, and if you feel like there's no way out, I'm saying to you that the walk of wisdom is to turn to God and say, God, what's your solution? Because with God, there's always, always a way out. I think the fourth takeaway is this. Don't ever be indifferent to sin. This woman had committed adultery. And Jesus wasn't indifferent. And you know, I have heard people say to me all that, oh, we can't judge, can't judge, can't judge. So let's say you don't judge. Can't you put your arm around somebody and say, can't you do better than this? Can't you do better? What's wrong with a man putting his arm around another man and saying, look, I know what you, what I saw you doing the other day. Can't you do better than this? What's wrong with another woman going to another woman and saying, you know, I know what you're doing. Can't you do better than this? That's what Jesus is saying. He didn't condemn, but he did challenge. Go. Do better. Leave your life of sin. I think the fifth takeaway is this. If you find yourself looking through a keyhole, hoping to accuse somebody, to condemn somebody, you're just on the wrong side of Jesus. Jesus isn't looking through the keyhole saying, oh, let me get that person. And you know what? It's so easy to do that, isn't it? It is so easy to look through the keyholes of life and pick somebody apart. And if that's what we're doing, then we're on the wrong side of Jesus. And the sixth takeaway is simply this. Jesus was a target. And you'll be a target one day, too. The mayor, the uh, fire chief of Atlanta was a target. Ruth Sweets was a target. You'll be a target. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. When Jesus was trapped, he didn't run away. He turned to God and he said, God, what am I supposed to do? He walked in wisdom. He stood his ground. Let me tell you something. The devil wants to trap you. Stand your ground. Walk with God. And finally, the seventh and last takeaway is this. This woman left with a new Lord and a new life. The Bible says, Jesus said, Woman, where are your accusers? No one, Lord, no one, sir. This woman chose that day, that moment, to surrender her life to Jesus Christ as Lord. And she walked away from there. Instead of being condemned, a new person with a new Lord and a brand new life. And that is possible for every one of us. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 says, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. Small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. There's always a crossroads for the crowd. The crowd that day, they stood there and they watched this woman be condemned. They were totally indifferent to the woman. You might be indifferent today. And if that's the case, there's not a lot we can do for you today. But the crowd was indifferent. Then there were those who just condemned. And they decided to walk away from Jesus. Maybe that's what you're going to do today. You're going to walk away from Jesus. We've talked to you about how Jesus can help you when you're trapped. We've talked to you about how you can have forgiveness instead of condemnation. But you will be free to walk out of those doors and never, ever, ever give your life to Jesus. That is your choice. But in this whole scenario... It wasn't the religious leaders. It wasn't the crowd of people. It was one woman who gave her life to the Lord. And as a result, she had a new Lord, 
and a new life. And that could be you today. That can be your choice. How do you make that choice? It's very simple. First of all, you decide where you want to spend your eternal days. Do you want to spend them in heaven with God or in hell with the devil? It is your choice. The Bible says in John 10, 9, I am the gate. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. If you want to spend eternity in heaven, there's one way and only one way. Jesus is the door. That's it. You can only get to heaven through Jesus. You need to settle that issue today. But you know, many of you are already Christians. And you say, Pastor, what about Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday? Would you like to live under the umbrella of God's protection and God's blessing? Would you like to experience that forgiveness instead of condemnation? Would you like to get out of the trap? Well, if you do, here's some specific things you can do. Number one, you can follow God's specific plan for your life. I know the plans that I have for you, God says. If you were to take that FOI thing, a tear out in the bullets and say, Pastor, I don't know God's specific plan. I'll help you. And I can tell you by the end of this year, you could be living God's specific plan for your life. What about following God's scriptural path? Psalms 119.1, Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. You quoted this morning, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But you know what? You'll walk out of this building and it'll be your decision whether you will live by the precepts and truths of this Bible or not. But if you do, then you can live under the umbrella of God's blessing and God's protection. Oh my gosh, Pastor! There are 66 books. How in the world am I supposed to know where to begin? Well, let's begin in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. God's stated path is very simple. Do justice. Okay, I can do that. Love mercy. I can be merciful. Instead of looking through the people, I'm going to be that type of person who instead of condemns and condones, I'm going to show the love and the mercy of God, and I'm going to challenge people to do better. We can do that. And I'm going to walk humbly with God. I am from this day forward, we're going to say, I don't understand everything in the Bible, but the truth that I do know, I'm going to walk humbly with God. If you want to walk out of here with God's umbrella of protection and blessing, why not begin with His specific plan for your life, His scriptural path, and His stated path. Father, thank You for Jesus. And thank You for the gift of eternal life. Now, Father, I believe that it's quite possible that somebody here is trapped. I mean, they're trapped. And there is no good solution to where they're at in their life. Except for the fact that there's a good solution in you. And I pray, Father, that today they might choose the walk of wisdom to choose to follow you. Father, the fact is, that some of us might feel very condemned. Like all the eyes of all of our friends in the world are just looking at us and saying, oh, you did wrong, 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 wrong. And all we want is to experience forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we could experience that forgiveness right here, right now, today. So Father, here we are at the crossroads. A choice is to be made. And it's a choice that we'll all make. The crowd was indifferent. The scribes and Pharisees walked away from Jesus. One sinner, one sinner chose to come to Jesus. And that's the choice that we have the opportunity to make right here, right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Let's sing it together. Come. Come to the altar. Take my hand. Jesus, I come. Let's sing it together. sorrow and night. Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Into thy freedom, gladness and light. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness and
I come to Thee, out of my shameful failure and loss, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. I come to Thee, out of earth's sorrows and to Thy balm, out of life's storms and into Thy calm, out of distress to jubilant song, Jesus, I come to Thee. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you this morning for the Lord Jesus, and I thank you, Lord, for the practicality of your word, that tomorrow or Tuesday or Wednesday when I'm in a box, when there's no way out, I will remember there is always a way out with God. Father, when I feel condemned or when I want to be a condemner, I'll remember that being on the right side of Jesus is not the condemner but it is the one who chooses to restore. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for this day. I pray your blessings now upon our offering. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Welcome to North Star Church. I'm Lisa. Here are today's announcements. Our 2015 goal for shoeboxes is 600. For January, we are collecting coloring books and crayons. The Dollar Tree is a good place for Bible story coloring books. Gary is still in need of volunteers for the middle school lock-in on Friday, February the 20th. Please let him know if you are willing to help. Sunday Night Youth resumes this evening at 6.30. Don't miss a minute of the fun. We will be finished around 8. Consider becoming a Saturday Prayer for Sunday Power. If you could pray any time between 8 a.m. and midnight on Saturdays, please let the church office know what time you will be praying. Thanks to all who have joined this very important ministry. If you haven't picked up your 2015 offering envelopes, please do so today as you leave. They are located on the back table. Thanks to everyone who is a pulpit prayer on Sunday mornings during the worship service. If you need a 2015 schedule, please contact the church office. The pulpit prayers are also listed in the North Star News each week. If you are not currently receiving the North Star News each week by email and you would like to, Please fill out the FYI card in your bulletin with your name and email address and you will be added to the list. Visitors and first time guests, we want to welcome you to North Star. We are so glad you joined us today. To help us get to know you better, fill out the FOI card in your bulletin, tear it off and leave it in your seat when you leave today. We promise we won't show up at your door unannounced. That's it for today's announcements. I'm Lisa. Go shine like stars, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Lisa. You can always tell who's doing the announcements. Their heads are down like this. Thank you, Lisa. You did a great job. Hey, listen, I want you to meet Raymond and Peggy. Raymond, Peggy, come here. This is Raymond and Peggy Mullins. They're friends of, where is she? I don't see Phyllis. She's upstairs praying. Well, isn't that ridiculous? Well, Phyllis prayed and her friends joined the church. So uh, praise the Lord. Hey, uh, I want you to welcome Raymond and Peggy into our church family. I had an opportunity to, to meet them. What? I had an opportunity to meet them a few weeks ago. And uh, they love the Lord Jesus. And uh, they really, really, really want to be a part of our church family. They love the Lord. And uh, do you think it's a good thing for Raymond and Peggy to be a part of our church family? Say Amen. 
Amen. Now, J.W., would you take them to the back? And uh, if you go with J.W., and if you're in J.W.'s class, if you might just go back with uh, Raymond and Peggy and welcome them into our church service. I want to remind you that there is no youth tonight. And so if you're coming tonight uh, for youth at 630, I wouldn't do that because Gary's sick. Gary's sick. He's home. He's not going to be here. So there's no youth. But it'll resume next week. I believe that our God is a great and mighty God. Do you believe that? Arbel, you have a great amen.